We're really excited tonight. Again, if, if uh, you've come in since the beginning, we have Mark Verkler and his daughter Charity is going to be with us. And Patty Verkler, Mark's wife, is here tonight. Why don't you stand up, Patty, and greet everybody. She's part of the reason that Mark is as awesome as he is, yeah? Would you say amen, Mark? Yes. Hallelujah. And Leah, why don't you stand up as well? Leo. Leo is married to charity, so praise God. One can put 1,000 in flight, two can put 10,000 in flight, and these two are causing demons to jump off cliffs. Glory to God. So let's put our hands together, together and give thanks to the incredible gift that's in Mark. How many are hearing God's voice better because of his ministry? Amen. Let's stand together and honor him as he comes. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's good to be here. Amen? A church that honors the presence of the Holy Spirit and has continued to do that for many years. I love it. If you love it, say amen. 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 It was about 31 years ago when I was here in Toronto teaching how to hear God's voice in a church. Uh, my teaching got done at 5 o'clock at night, and I heard that Herman Riffel was teaching that evening on Christian dream interpretation. And that sparked my interest, and I went over to his seminar and uh, sat in and was awed because he taught me that you can hear God's voice all night as well as hearing God's voice all day. And I was so thrilled, we brought him down to Buffalo, we had a video, we videotaped him teaching 24 half hour sessions on Christian dream interpretation, and he was my mentor on Christian dream interpretation. And uh, I've loved the last 31 years because I have learned how to interpret dreams. We started with Herman Riffle's video series. The first couple times we taught it in our Bible school, I just used his videos because he was the master. He, he had won, went, he's a Baptist pastor. He had gone to the Jungian Institute in Europe. Young has studied 50,000 dreams. And Herman Riffle spent time there and learned principles of dream interpretation, which he brought back the ones he felt he could ground in scripture, and he was sharing those. Of course, some people say, well, could you learn anything from Young because Young was a non-Christian? Well, that's a good question. Can we learn anything? Can a non-Christian have truth? Anyone know the answer? Yes. Yeah, most definitely. The Bible clearly teaches that. God gave Pharaoh dreams. Pharaoh was a non-Christian. He had Israel enslaved, uh, and yet God gave him dreams of seven skinny cows, seven fat cows, so yeah. God gives revelation to heathen, so yeah, we can learn from a heathen, we can learn from a non-Christian, and Herman brought back some wonderful principles from, from Young, a man who studied 50,000 dreams in his lifetime. So I learned from Herman and loved what he taught me. After I'd listened to him three times teach a class, a class at Buffalo School of the Bible, I began to teach it myself, and just as Herman stood on, Paul, uh, on, on Young's shoulders and improved his message, I was able to stand on Herman's shoulders and say a few things that I felt were a little clearer and more helpful to me. And now my daughter Charity has been able to stand on my shoulders. And uh, yeah, a, clarify it even more, amen? Woo, yeah. So how many know that's actually the way it's supposed to be, amen? We stand on the shoulders of the previous generation and we seek to improve and present their message. So uh, we've got a few PowerPoints to go along with tonight's session. So just a few scientific observations about dreams. First of all, we all dream about an hour or two every single night. And uh, we do it during light sleep. Now you may say, I don't dream. Well, if you say that, you're obviously lying because you do dream. Because in uh, dream laboratories, they can tell when a person's dreaming. And the second line says, the dream state is REM sleep which stands for rapid eye movement. And that means that uh, your eyeballs are moving around. And the reason they're moving around is because you're actually watching, as you're watching the dream inside your being, these eyes are the ones that are doing the watching, which is, uh, I find that absolutely astounding that God has connected the inner eyes of my heart with the eyes of my head. And these eyes move when, when I'm seeing vision on the inside. But what they've done is um, they, they can, wake a person up right after they dream. This one guy in the dream laboratory, his eyes were going back and forth, back and forth. They woke him up after the dream and said, 
what were you dreaming? He said, I was watching a ping pong game. <laughs> All right, so, so you can tell when a person's dreaming. And so they know that we all dream about an hour and a half every night. Now, if you don't recall your dreams, uh, we're going to give you some hints tomorrow as to how to recall your dreams. I'm going to give you one right now. If you put a piece of paper next to your bed tonight, ask God to give you a dream, you'll probably have one when you come back to the seminar, seminar tomorrow. And by lunchtime, you'll have learned enough principles and watched us interpret three dreams live right here from the stage so that over lunch, you can share your dream with whoever you're having lunch with and you can interpret the dream together with them. So that's what I propose to you for tonight, all right? So light sleep is REM sleep, rapid eye movement. And um, if they stop you from dreaming, which they can do, every time in a sleep laboratory, every time they see a person's eyes begin to move, they've tried an experiment. They've just woke him up before they, he had a chance to dream. And if they do that, within three days, you enter into a nervous breakdown, which shows how important dreams are. Uh, they're the guardian of our hearts and the guardian of our sanity. They're what keeps us sane. It's our heart communicating to us and helping resolve the, the traumas that it needs to resolve. I find that really, really interesting. Our dreams are the guardians of our mental and our emotional well-being. Because that's not what everybody believes. I mean, I've read some systematic theology books just to see what the church believes, because you, know, you can probably go to about 1,000 churches and find out which one offers a, a course on Christian dream interpretation. It'd probably be like zero or one or two out of 1,000 that do, which means the church has decided to ignore 50 dreams of the Bible, and the stories that come out of those 50 dreams is about one-third of the Bible, and we've seen fit to ignore it and not even offer a Sunday school class on it, which I find absolutely astounding that Satan has allowed us, gotten us to take a third of the Bible and dump it in the dumpster and say, it's irrelevant to my life. Because how many know no part of the Bible is irrelevant to our lives? Amen? Amen. Amen. So uh, this one systematic theology book I was reading, like a guy who was writing, he said, if you dream, that's an indication that you're probably psychotic. <laughs> I said, no, 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 no. I said, the opposite is true. If you're not allowed to dream, you're going to go into psychosis. So that guy who figured he was a theologian, wrote a big series of, of theological masterpieces, didn't have a clue as to what truth was or what the Bible taught about dreams. So tonight, we're going to give you a few verses to get you started. And tomorrow, we're going to go from 9 to 5 and give you a whole ton more. So you walk out of here able to understand dreams and interpret your own dreams and help other people with theirs also. It al always does amaze me the different attitudes people bring to dreams. I already shared with you one which is totally unscientific and totally unbiblical. Let me share one other one before we get into the really positive. Might just well be negative first, so we can be positive second. But I do know a Pentecostal denomination that a co-pastor of mine was going to go and be ordained by. And they sat him down and said, well, you know, if you are ordained by us, you need to renounce any belief in dreams. And he said, no, I can't do that. So they said, well, then fine, we won't ordain you. Now, that's the position taken by a Pentecostal church denomination. I had a chance to sit down with the president of, of that Bible Institute and have lunch with him one day. And I asked him, I said, why don't you guys believe in dreams? And he told me the reason they don't believe in dreams. <laughs> he said they had a girl come to their Bible school and uh, she came because of a dream. And she was quite a character and she was kind of misbehaving all the time she was there. And by the time she was through half of her education, she had another dream which said, now it's time to go on the mission field because you're prepared and equipped. And they told her, no, you're not prepared and equipped, you should stay here. And then she said, nope, I got a dream. So she followed a dream, went to the mission field, blew up, self-destructed, came back to the Bible school all wounded and bleeding. And he said, that's the reason we don't believe in dreams. <laughs> I said, well, excuse me, was the problem the fact that we received dreams or was the problem the fact that this woman was rebellious and independent and unwilling to receive counsel? What do you think it was, one or two? It was number two. And how many of you know anything in the Bible can be abused by somebody, and if we use that as our criteria for throwing it away, how many know Satan can get us to throw away any section of scripture by simply having somebody abuse it, amen? And how many know it's not a proper hermeneutic, hermeneutic to throw something away just simply because somebody can abuse it? 
So um, I just find all of that pretty amazing, all right? And uh, so let's go forward one more PowerPoint if we can. Uh, this is a little bit more about science, the last thing we're gonna do on science tonight. Um, what they've discovered, as you go to sleep, you go from beta level waves, faster waves in your mind, down to alpha, that's light sleep, and theta is deeper, and delta is really deep, deep sleep. And then after 90 minutes, you come back up into alpha, where you're almost awake, and many of us do wake up an hour and a half or three hours into our nightly cycle, because we're in alpha and get up to go to the bathroom or whatever. But during alpha is when you have your dream period. That's your REM period. And so it's a, kind of a short period the first time you come up after 90 minutes, but it gets, every time you come back up into alpha, it gets longer and longer. And if you sleep eight hours, that whole last hour is almost all alpha level sleep, which is why we all get about an hour and a half of dreams every single night. All right, let's go forward another PowerPoint, see where that might take us, if we can. God has uh, always used dreams in the Bible. So we've heard what some foolishness has said. Let's hear what God says about dreams in the Bible. Because how many know that's what counts? Please say, that's what counts. <laughs> Everything else doesn't really count at all. So here we are near the beginning of the Old Testament. God declared that he would speak through dreams and visions. Hear now my words, if there's a prophet among you, I the Lord shall, say shall, make myself known to him in a vision and I, what, shall speak with him in a dream. Did he say this is a possibility or this is a definite? It's a definite. So God definitely declared if we're a prophetic people, which how many know this congregation is a prophetic group, am I right? He said, I'm definitely giving you dreams. And I said, well, I didn't get a dream for the first 10 years of my Christian life. Well, it's because I didn't honor them, didn't ask for them, didn't believe in them, judged them, despised them. That's why. So now I've gotten over all that sickness, and I now honor and ask and receive, and I get dreams every single week. All right. Okay. That's the beginning of the Old Testament. God declares what he's going to do. Can we go forward to PowerPoint, and we'll get to the end of the Old Testament. Hosea, one of the minor prophets, God said, I did it. What I told you I would do, I've done it. He says, I have also spoken to the prophets, and I gave numerous visions through the prophets, and I gave parables. So God said, look, I told you I was going to do it, and I just want you to know I did it. Say he did it. Okay, so that's the Old Testament. How about the New Testament? Do they, they carry on with dreams in the New Testament? Acts 2.17, it shall be in the last days. If you believe we're in the last days, say amen. amen. This verse applies to us right now. I'm going to pour out of my spirit upon all mankind. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men, what? Shall see visions. Your old men, what? Shall dream dreams. All right. That's, that's clear declaration. All right. We're, that's for us. We get dreams and we get visions. But like I say, I didn't because I didn't believe in them, ask for them, honor them, or put paper next to my bed to record them when I woke up. Now I do all those things and I do get dreams every week and you can too if you make that same change that I did. So that's the beginning of the New Testament. Let's go to the end of the New Testament and see what the end has to say. <clears throat> Last book of the Bible, Revelation. It's all vision, whole thing. John said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. I heard a voice behind me like the sound of a trumpet saying, write in a book what you see. And that having your journal, pencil, and paper, and writing things down is an important part to receiving visions and receiving dreams. He received 22 chapters of visions and journaled them all out so we still have them today. So from Genesis to Revelation, God gave dreams and visions and declared he would continue to in the last days. If that's clear enough for you, would you say amen? amen. How many though that's basically irrefutable as to what God's intention and God's purpose is for us for dreams. And I live in a culture that has chosen not to, historically, not to honor dreams. I think they're gonna change their mind. They're probably in the process of doing that. And uh, we're gonna ask all of you to change your mind this weekend and honor dreams and receive from dreams because there's a lot of good stuff that, that comes through dreams. <clears throat> Can we go forward maybe one more PowerPoint, please? This will be our last PowerPoint tonight for my part of the section. Here's what God says he does through our dreams. 
The verse in the middle, I will bless Jehovah who has given me counsel. Yea, my heart instructs me in the night seasons. Wow. That's free counsel every night from the wonderful counselor. You tell me how much is that worth? <laughs> how many vote for a million bucks? I mean, I could go to a counselor for 150, I can go to a psychiatrist for 250, or I can get an hour and a half of free counsel every night from the wonderful counselor. How many know that's a deal? Because how many know he gives the best counsel in the entire universe? So he's clearly said, look, dreams are counsel from me. They're counsel for me. Counsel. And I said, really? They look like leftover pizza to me, you know, just, you know, all this ridiculous, weird things. He said, well, it's symbol, it's symbolic. How many know the dreams of the Bible are all symbolic? They are, all right? So uh, how, about a, how about if I give you a couple of my dreams before I turn this over to Charity and let her teach you some stuff, all right? Where God was giving me some counsel. This happened in 1979, and uh, I had just learned the four keys to hearing God's voice, which you all have those memorized, I'm sure. I'm sure you could all shout them out to me because I've taught them here for what, 20, 25 years. <clears throat> Quiet yourself down, fix your eyes on Jesus, tune to spontaneity, and write. Say it together with me. Quiet yourself down, fix your eyes on Jesus, tune to spontaneity, and write. Well, those four keys God taught me from Habakkuk 2, 1 and 2. And uh, the day he taught them to me, I tried them, and uh, they worked. And I went to Patty every half hour, and I showed her what I'd written, and it was, it, she said, she told me it was God. And it raised my level of faith because I had never done those four things together before as a bundle ever. And I went back and I journaled some more, journaled some more. And that day I journaled five hours. And I'm a guy who'd never heard, identified God's voice before in my life. And that particular day, I was able to write for five hours of God talking to me because I used those four keys as a bundle. Quieted myself down, pictured Jesus here with me, asked him a question, tuned to flow, and the flowing thoughts that came back, I wrote them down. I got five hours of God talking to me. I thought, man, if I'd have known it was that simple, if somebody could have ever actually said that, I could have done that 10 years sooner, but no one was able to say this. Now, how about if you repeat this after me so you can say it? <laughs> say this, hearing God's voice is as simple as Quieting yourself down, fixing your eyes on Jesus, tuning to spontaneity, and writing. All right, so I did that for five hours. That night, I put paper and pencil next to my bed, asked God for a dream. I had not recalled a dream for nine months, but that simple act of putting paper and pencil there, I recalled three dreams that night. So tonight, if you want to put paper and pencil next to your bed and ask for a dream, you'll come back tomorrow with dreams. Here's the first dream I had. I'm, um, I have a new job. I'm the caretaker of a house. I'm going up the stairs into the bathroom, getting cleaning supplies out. I'm coming back down the stairs and I'm riding a horse. Now, if you've never ridden a horse up the stairs and turned it around in the bathroom and brought it back down, you have no idea how difficult this is. How many vote for a pizza dream here? May I just see your hands? How many vote for God giving wonderful counsel? May I see your hands? And how many don't wanna vote until we interpret the thing, all right? You're very smart, I'm with you, okay? So, easiest way to interpret a dream is start with symbol one and ask what could it mean? Well, symbol one says I got a new job. So, since dreams come out of the day I'm living in, well, what was my new job that day? Well, that new job that day was the four keys to hearing God's voice. All right, so you're right, I did get a new job. I learned how to hear God's voice. So, how comfortable does that dream indicate I feel about these four keys of spontaneity, vision, journaling, and flow? Comfortable or uncomfortable? I feel really uncomfortable. I feel like a horse on the stairwell. I feel like a bull in the china closet. I said, God, I'm not into intuition. I'm not into flow. I'm not into pictures and journaling. I don't like any of those things. Matter of fact, I'm not good at it. I'm, I'm a theologian. I like boxes and charts and graphs. All right, so the dream said, yeah, I understand. You feel really uncomfortable about this new track you're on, this new job. However, if you stick with it and don't abandon it and whine and cry and just lay down and say, I can't do it, if you stick with it, guess what it's going to do? It's going to take you up a flight of stairs. Anyone want to take a wild guess what that could symbolize? <laughs> higher place in God. How many think hearing God's voice and seeing vision can take you to a higher place in God? Amen? 
I thought, well, that's encouraging. Maybe I shouldn't whine and quit. Maybe I should hang on in there, okay? And when we get there, we're going to get some cleaning supplies out. What might that symbolize? <laughs> God's going to clean up things in my heart. He said, don't be so judgmental. I said, hey, you send people to hell, so do I. What's the problem, you know? So he said, no, 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 no. He says, uh, he says uh, you're not like me at all, okay? So he said, Mark, don't be so judgmental. That was one, that's cleaning supplies. He told me that like about a, a hundred times that year. And he also told me a hundred times, Mark, will you trust me? Because I'd never learned to trust flow or trust vision or trust flowing pictures or flowing thoughts. No one ever, I went to school and college, no one taught me that. So I had a hard battle to trust him, you know? So, uh, so he said, will you trust me? That was cleaning supplies. Will you please abandon your stupid doubt and fear and unbelief and believe? Just believe there's a river within you, it really flows, would you do that? After a hundred times, I said, yeah, I think maybe. <laughs> Not that I'm a slow learner, I'm just telling you, okay? Cleaning supplies, say cleaning supplies. And of course, the third thing the Lord told me about 50 times was, was love my wonderful wife, Patty. And I said, I will as soon as I fix her. And God said, no, 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 she's fine, okay? She's fine. I said, yeah, but she's like kind of quiet, you know, and she should be talkative. And God said, no, she's fine the way she is. And um, so finally, I decided to love Patty just the way she was. And Patty said her marriage improved greatly when I learned how to hear God's voice, okay? But, <laughs> but um, how many know that's called cleaning supplies? Because I stopped pressuring my wife to be more like me. Because I was sure she'd be happier if she was more like me, okay? So it's just part of being egocentric, okay? So um, all interpersonal relationships improve when you can hear the voice of God. I'm totally, 100% convinced of that. Okay, how many believe that that dream was wonderful counsel to me from the wonderful counselor? If you believe that, say amen. amen. Because you know what? I'm, I'm just tempted to be like the Israelites who got out there in the wilderness and said, I don't know if I can believe and trust, you know, the promised land. I don't know. I, I think I'm going to die here. You know, and of course they did die there because they were believing that, speaking that, you know, uh, confessing that, picturing that. I could have done that, but God said, Mark, Here's a picture. You're going up a flight of stairs. Yeah, I know you feel awkward. Don't give up. It's taking you someplace good. How many know that picture could motivate me not to whine and cry and quit? How many know that's worth a million dollars right there? Because quitters don't get the promised land. That's the first counsel I got that night. God gave me some more counsel. Second dream I had that night, I pulled my car into a parking lot. I turn it off, and it doesn't turn off. It continues to backfire. <laughs> All right, another little easy principle for interpreting dreams. You just ask, how am I experiencing that symbol in my life right now? So I could ask the question, if I apply that to this dream, what is there in my life right now I'm trying to turn off it doesn't want to turn off? Those of you who know me well know exactly what it was I was trying to turn off. You can shout it out if you want to. Yeah, my left brain, my reasonal, reason and logic and theology, because I'd lived out of logic. I'm a theologian. So I, I run everything through the funnel of my brain, and analytical theology, logic. And I was turning that off saying, hey, we're going to go with flow, flowing pictures and flowing thoughts. And my brain said, are you kidding? <laughs> you don't turn me off. I'm the God that rules your life. I said, well, you've been the God that ruled my life, but I realize you're a false God because the Bible says my thoughts are not his thoughts and my ways aren't his ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are his thoughts higher than mine. So guess what? You're not God. God speaks into my heart, all right? And I'm going to honor the river and the flow from my heart more than I honor my reason theology. And my brain fussed about it for a little while and finally decided, I think you've got biblical truth on your side, so it let go and I dropped a false god, and, and I went into true Christianity, which is you live out of your heart rather than living out of your head. So uh, how many think that was pretty nice counsel? Because, you know, as I'm going through this battle, you know, do I, do I let go of analysis and theology and logic that's been my guiding principle? Well, I think so. I can look up those words in the Bible, just see what the Bible says. What's the Bible say about theology, theologian, and logic? Guess what? There's no verse on any one of those three words in the whole Bible. There's not even a verse on any one of them. Well, how many think you could give it up since there's no verses on it in the first place? Amen? Amen? Amen. <laughs> that was pretty weak. Amen? Amen? You're not quite sure you're with me, and that's okay. You, know, you, can, you can journal about it and ask the Lord, and he'll tell you. That'll be fine, all right? 
I'm flexible. It took me a while to come to that position myself. All right, so that's, that's, that was more counsel that night. Had some more counsel the third night, the same night, I had a third dream. The third dream was this. Uh, I got arrested by a policeman. <laughs> Sounds like a party, don't you think? <laughs> so if we use that number one million dollar question, how am I experiencing that symbol in my life right now? I'm going to ask it this way. I'm going to say, who in my life right now is seeking to arrest me? Anyone know the answer to that question? Holy Spirit. As I tuned to flow and journaled for five hours, I was being arrested by the Holy Spirit. He was bringing me under his authority and his dominion and his domain. And I was no longer under the authority of my mind. I was in the, under the authority of the river of God that flows from my heart. So the second dream showed I was giving up one authority. Third dream showed I was embracing another authority. And the first dream showed it was a struggle to make this all happen. How many know that's a quite a bit of decent counsel for one night, don't you think? And if we can all get that, how many know there's seven billion people in the world who get counsel like that every single night? Because God gives dreams and revelations to everybody. I mean, you can type in Muslims being saved through dreams on Google and you'll find God gave dreams to Muslims and visions to Muslims and Jesus showed up and spoke to them and got them saved. It's just amazing, all right? How many know since God speaks into everybody's heart every night, he's obviously going to win? How many know that gives you the cutting edge in any war, all right? If you have access to your enemy's hearts every night and give, give them counsel, you absolutely are going to win. Amen? I like it. I like it. So that's a uh, very brief introduction to what we're going to cover tomorrow. Um, and uh, we sure invite you to come from 9 to 5. We do have a bunch of free stuff over there on that table on the side, so you're welcome to pick up anything that's on that table. It's all free about our ministry, if you want to explore some of these things deeper. But what we want to do for the rest of the night uh, is let you hear from Charity also. So Charity, if you would come, I'm going to tell them about you while you're making your way up here, all right? Charity, of course, is my daughter, and of course I'm prejudiced, but I think she's one of the greatest daughters in the entire universe, all right? So, woohoo! And Patty says the same thing, all right? Now, um, you can hold your applause just for a second. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about her, and then you can actually go crazy if you want to, all right? So, um, Charity will be the prime primary teacher tomorrow. She's going to teach most of the times. I'm just going to come in and interpret six different dreams throughout the day. We've got six people picked out, and they've shared the dreams, and we're going to interpret them live so you can see how the process works. So it'll be a hands-on workshop, but Charity will be doing the teaching, and I'll just be filling in here and there. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, Charity is standing on my shoulders, and she has taken what I had, and I believe she's improved it and clarified it and made it even better. And I think you're going to find that tomorrow as you listen to her. Charity um, has a brand new book that's coming out in November. It's called Hearing God Through Your Dreams. And uh, Destiny Image published it. And guess what? They sent some advanced copies here for tonight, for this weekend. Woo! All right? So they're in the resource center in the back. I think it's the best book on dream interpretation on the market today. Uh, and you can stop by the resource center tonight or tomorrow or Sunday, and they have a bunch of copies. Sid Roth has also invited Charity to come and teach uh, and do a, a seminar on dream interpretation this fall. So she'll be on Sid Roth's show this fall, too. Woo! Amen. And uh, what have I missed? All right. So um, I, this, is, this is Charity's debut. All right. She's shared this seminar once in Florida at our graduation for Christian Leadership University. So I've heard it once, it was awesome. This is her first major conference, all right? So we're really excited for her, and I want you to be excited for her. And how about if you just give her a, give her a standing ovation, would you? Come on, let's go crazy, woo! All right, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. How many of you guys hope I am as good as he just got done saying I would be? <laughs> Me too. Well, I am so excited to be here with you tonight. Um, we just drove up from New York, 
and I'm so excited to be talking about one of my most favorite subjects, which is hearing God through our dreams. So as we start out, I just want to let you know exactly what we mean by that. Um, we are actually talking about hearing God through our dreams every night. We are talking about connecting with heaven every night. We are talking about receiving divine revelation every single night of our lives. So if that sounds good to you, I want you to say amen. amen. All right. So what kind of dreams are we talking about? Um, you know, if you have a dream and God himself shows up in your dream and he says, hey, go here, do this, that's pretty clear. Okay, nothing is lost in translation. You do not need a class on dream interpretation to figure out that dream. However, most of us don't have dreams like that. Sometimes we do, and that's awesome. But most of the time, our dreams are weird. They're crazy. Those are the dreams we're talking about hearing God through. We're talking about hearing him through those dreams that you don't even want to tell anybody about, because then they're going to think you're nuts. Those are the dreams that God is speaking to us through. And they're really not that weird, and they're really not that crazy. They're just communicated in a different language. God speaks a different language um, when he speaks to us at night, and it's a picture language. So we just need to learn how to decode and decrypt the symbolism in that language, and then we understand the meaning. We're able to translate that language that God is speaking in the night. So tonight, I am going to share a few of my dreams, and we are going to look at some scriptures, and I'm going to talk a little bit about a lot of different dream interpretation principles. Then tomorrow, we are going to go in depth, and we're going to carefully examine each building block for dream work um, to, so that you really understand it, so that it really makes sense, and you're fully equipped, and you own the revelation. So tonight, it's kind of going to kind of be like a general overview to give you a feel for how dream interpretation works, and then that'll give you a vision of where we're headed tomorrow. So if that sounds good to you, say amen. amen. All right. So the first thing that we need to understand about dreams, and Dad mentioned this, is that they are symbolic. So they're not literal. Like the stuff in our hap that happens in our dreams, it doesn't literally come true. So they're symbolic and metaphorical. They're allegorical. Everything in our dreams represents something else. So we want to not take things literally. If we dream of a person or a place, it's not really representing that person or place. It's representing something else. So the first thing to understand is that dreams are communicated in a picture language. The awesome thing about a picture language is that it can be learned. Languages can be learned. So dream interpretation is a skill that anyone can learn. You can cultivate the skill. With practice, you can master it. You can become fluent in that language. So the revelation is that dream interpretation is not a special gift that's bestowed on a few favored individuals. Dream interpretation is a language that anybody can become fluent in. For example, we are up here in Canada with you, and if you guys, if you say something to me in French, and I understand what you say, are you going to say, ooh, wow, Charity, you have the gift of French. <laughs> I don't have the gift of French. I studied. I invested time. I practiced to learn that language. And so it is with dreams and the language that God speaks to us at night. So to start out, I just want to address a very common misconception a misunderstanding about dreams. Because a lot of times, we will have dreams at night that they're about, they seem to be about what happened during the day. 
Like if we went to the beach, we might have the ocean in our dream. And we're like, oh, I'm just recycling that event. You know, if we get together with friends and that person, then they show up in our dream. And we're like, oh, I'm just, it's just reruns. You know, I'm just repeating, playing over, recycling leftovers. That's nothing to pay attention to. You know, it's just a repeat, it's just a rerun. But that's actually not the case because of the first thing we've already learned. The language is symbolic. So that person that showed up in your dream, they represent something else. Or that ocean that showed up in your dream, it represents something else. The thing is, God will use symbols, thank you, um, from our waking world, and specifically our immediate waking world. So he knows we went to the beach, so there's an ocean. But that ocean represents something else. So we still want to decode it and decrypt it and realize it's not just recycling leftovers. We still want to honor that dream. There's a deeper meaning. There's a deeper message. So we want to pray into it. We still want to work with the dream, and we want to get God's message through it. So I will share one of my own dreams to illustrate exactly what I mean. In my dream, I was on a pole vaulting team. And so everyone on my team, they were doing great. They were, whew, they were pole vaulting over the big high bar. And then it came my turn and I just, I couldn't. I was just, I was struggling to get over the bar because I was actually sick in the dream and I was weak and I couldn't get over. And everybody else could. So then a couple of my friends came over and they helped nurse me back to health. Then I was able to also pole vault over the bar too. So that's the dream. So we might say, oh, you're just watching too much Rio, too much Olympics, you know, there's no meaning, there's no message, what does that mean? So the first thing though, we wanna ask about the dream to find the meaning, to find the message, is look at the key action. The key action, for every dream we wanna say, what is the key action? So in the dream, what am I doing? So, in this dream, what am I doing? Well, I am struggling to get over something. That's what I'm doing. That's the big, that's a big thing. I'm struggling to get over something. So then, I need to consider the setting. The second question we ask about every dream is what is the setting? And the setting is what is going on in my waking life when I have the dream? What am I thinking about right before I go to bed? What was I praying for? What happened? And this right here actually illustrates why you are the best person to interpret your dreams. Because you, better than anyone, know the setting. You know what you were thinking about. You know what you were praying for. So the dreamer themselves is the most qualified person to ever interpret the dream. So you guys are empowered, you're equipped, you already know the setting, and that's a big part of dream work. So we have to look at my setting, and what was I thinking about? We wanna take into account, well, it's something that I'm struggling with, struggling to get over. So where in my waking life am I struggling to get over something? So we take the picture of the dream, we take the setting from my waking life, we overlay it on top of it. And then it shifts the picture into focus. And we say, see which specific area of our life the dream is speaking to. So, well, that particular time in my life, someone had said something to me and I was just, like annoyed and I was like, maybe I need to confront this person and let them know I didn't really appreciate it. Then on the other hand, I'm like, you know what, Charity, don't be petty, just forgive the person, walk in love. I'm like, God, you know, should I confront the person or should I just, you know, get over it? Well, the dream was God's answer to my heart's question. Like, Charity, see, everybody else, they were getting over it, okay? And the only reason you couldn't is because you were weak. If you're spiritually strong, if you're spiritually healthy, you should have no trouble getting over it. 
So just forgive this person. Walk in love as much as it lies with you. Live at peace with all men and just get over it. So that was God's message through the dream. And then the most important thing of dream interpretation work is after you get the revelation, you need to act on it. That's what they always did in the Bible. When they got God's message, then they acted on it. So by his grace, I did do that. So that's the, that's the final part of dream work is obedience to God's revelation. So we see two things there. There's two things in our dream decoder. We look at the action. What is the key action in the dream? What am I doing? Then we look at the setting. What's going on in my waking world when I have this dream? The third key question that we want to ask about every dream is what is the key emotion? What is the key emotion? So like in the dream, how am I feeling? Am I excited? Am I disappointed? Am I frustrated? Am I angry? Am I grateful? And again, we take that emotion from our dream and say, okay, where in my waking life am I feeling this emotion? Oh, I'm really nervous. Oh, I'm really nervous about this upcoming test. Okay, well, we overlay the setting from our waking life onto the dream by matching up the key feeling and the key action. And then we know, oh, this is the area of my life that the dream is speaking to. So I'll share another dream that illustrates all three of these key questions that we want to look at. In, um, in the dream, I became Santa Claus. You know, every December, there's those Christmas movies. And you know, like Tim Allen, um, he does them. He, there's the old Santa Claus, and then there's the new Santa Claus, and the old one's retiring, and then the new one comes, and you know, he needs to learn how to fly around the world in a single night. And, and I was him. He was me. And I was just like, whew, obviously pretty unsure about this, as they always are in those Santa movies. And um, then the old Santa, he christened me with the magic Santa superpowers. And then I was like, oh, I can totally do this. I can. And I was excited. And I was empowered and equipped. And that was the dream. So what does that mean? Well, number one, we look at the action. What is the key action of this dream? I am being positioned. I'm getting a new job, right? I have this new responsibility. That's a big thing going on in this dream. Then we're going to look at the key emotion. How am I feeling in the dream? Well. I was a little unsure at first, but then I got the Xana superpowers, so I felt really equipped, and I felt good about it. So I want to say where in my waking life do I have a new job, and am I feeling kind of unsure about it? So I consider that question about my waking world, what's going on in my day, overlay it and figure out what area of my life the dream is speaking to. So, in my waking life, when I had this dream, it just so happened that my husband, Leo, and I had just been asked to lead a couple's Bible study. And we're like, oh yeah, that'd be fun. And, and so we did, and it was, just, it was for a group of people, though, that we really didn't know very well, and just, a few weeks into this thing, you know, it just it quickly became apparent that my husband and I were the only charismatics in the group. So everyone else was really sincere in their faith, but just when it came to like the gifts of the spirit, like the gift of tongues and the gift of prophecy and the gift of healing, you know, they, they weren't really interested in those. So that left me feeling that we were not the right people to be leading this group because my husband and I are at the other end of the spectrum and we want everything that God has for us. And so 
I was just like, I don't know about this. I let my husband know, honey, I don't know about this. We drove home that night. I'm just, I think God needs to get somebody else. You know, somebody that's just, you know, they kind of have a more similar vision. And, and you better believe I let God know about this. I'm like, I don't, I don't think, God, you see what's going on down here. And so that was a question that was on my heart when I had that dream. So God is getting me out of myself because I'm just looking at the natural and it's just a little messy. But God, through our dream, he gives us his perspective. We get a heavenly point of view. And he's like, well, let me show you how I see this. Okay, you're not with this group by chance. Is your life not ordered? Do I not orchestrate everything? It's like, it's not random that you're here. So let me give you this dream and I will show you how I see it. Out of all of the people in the world, you are the ones that I chose to put in this group for this season. Because they need what I've placed in you. So I've positioned you for this assignment and you have been anointed with supernatural power. That was the Santa superpowers. That was God's anointing. And he was equipping me. And he was giving me the, the grace and the wisdom to thrive in this situation and to bless these people and to present God in all his supernatural glory to them in a relevant way. And so I woke up from this dream and I was like, yes. God, this is awesome. I'm like, okay, I do. I feel empowered. I feel equipped. Just like I did in the dream, I was unsure at first, but now I'm like, okay, I'm ready. I'm empowered. But I did take issue with God on the specific symbol used. Santa Claus. Really? Of course, I had to explain to God you know, this is a very unspiritual symbol, okay? God, number one. Number two, this is entirely extra biblical. Okay, there's no Santa in scripture. You really could have come up with, you know, a little bit better symbol for me in my dream. Come on. So while I'm trying to enlighten God, <laughs> he's laughing. Jesus is laughing. And he says, ah, oh, come on, chair. Don't you get it? You're a carrier of my presence. <laughs> You're bringing me and my gifts to the group. It's like, oh, well, God, if you put it that way, I guess it was a good symbol. <laughs> so, those are a few dream interpretation principles that how they worked in my life. So now we actually want to see how these exact same principles, how they worked in some, a dream in the Bible. So let's everybody turn to Judges. Judges chapter 7. Judges chapter 7 and... We know the, the first thing we have to ask about every single dream is what is the setting? We do not know anything about a dream until we know the setting. So I will give you the setting of this dream. Let me give you the background of the dream. We're gonna talk about Gideon. We know that guy. He's a good guy. You know, he had some trust issues, a bit of an inferiority complex. He was doing his best. So remember, like, Midian was oppressing Israel. And so Gideon was just, like, hiding in a wine press, threshing grain. So he was just kind of hiding out. And God comes to him, and he's like, hey, Gideon, mighty man of valor. Gideon's like, who, me? Gideon's like, no, sorry, you got the wrong guy. And God's like, no, Gideon, mighty man of valor, I've chosen you to lead my people to victory against uh, Midian. Come on, 
Let's go to war. And Gideon's like, God, no, you don't understand. I'm like, I'm like the least in my family. And our family is like least in our tribe. And I'm really not, not the person for this job. And God's like, hey, mighty man of valor, let's go to war. So Gideon's like, okay, God, if it's really you, I just, I need a sign, right? I want to know that it's really you speaking and that you're really telling me to do this big, huge, crazy thing. And so we know he does the whole fleece deal, right? He's like, okay, God, if it's really you, I'm going to put my fleece on the ground at night and then just make the whole thing soaking wet with dew, but make all the ground around it be totally dry. How about that? God's like, okay, yeah, sure, here. And so he does, and he's like, okay. Now I'm pretty sure it's you, God, but just, okay, one more thing. Could we just flip it around? Could you just like do the opposite, just one more, one more night? So, okay, so I'm gonna put my fleece down, and I just, I want, I want the fleece totally dry, and then the ground, all around it to be wet with dew. God humors him, right? God is infinitely patient with us. And so he does it. Two signs God gives him, confirms his word to him. So Gideon is like, okay, God, let's go to war. He's ready now. And God's like, hey, just one more thing. Okay, just by the way, that army that you have of 32,000 soldiers too big. Ah, too big. Because then you're going to go to war and you're going to win. And you're going to say it was the strength of your arm that gave you the victory. And I want you to know that it's me giving you the victory. So we got to cut it down. And we know the story. God whittled his army of 32,000 strong down to 300 guys. 300 guys. How many know Gideon is back to freaking out? Yeah? But then there is a dream. And then there is an interpretation. And that changes everything. So that's where we're going to pick up the story in Judges chapter 7. Judges chapter 7 in verse 9 says that now the same night it came about that the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hands. But if you are afraid to go down, go with Purah, your servant, down to the camp. And you will hear what they say, and afterwards your hand will be strengthened, that you may go down against the camp. So he went with Purah, his servant, down to the outposts of the, of the army that was in the camp. Now the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the sons of the east were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts, and their camels were without number, as numerous as the sand on the seashore. Verse 13, when Gideon came, behold, a man was relating a dream to his friend, and he said, behold, I had a dream, a loaf of barley bread was tumbling into the camp of Midian. And it came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned it upside down so that the tent lay flat. And his friend answered and said, Oh, this is nothing less than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given Midian and all the camp into his hand. And it came about when Gideon heard the account of the dream and its interpretation, that he bowed in worship. He returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the camp of Midian into your hands. Whew. There's a whole lot of revelation we can get about dreams in just this passage of Scripture. So let's look at it carefully. Let's look at verse 9 again and see what it says. Now, this same night it came about that the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp. I have given it into your hands. But if you're afraid to go down, then go with Perot, your servant, down to the camp. So 
We see in verse 9, God is already telling him, go get the Midianites. We know. God has been telling him over and over again, go to war. So he didn't make this huge decision to go to war based just on a dream. So we don't want to make huge, life-altering decisions based just on a dream. We want to take that into account of, with all the other ways that God speaks. God is speaking to us in our waking world through journaling, through prophetic words, through the Bible, through our spiritual advisors, through peace ruling in our heart. But dreams are one of the ways that he will confirm that, another way to get revelation to us and if God keeps telling us something over and over in our waking life and we're not getting it, then he will use a dream to kick us into gear. And that's what happened here. God said, I've already told you, but if you still need encouragement, go listen to the dream. So then let's jump down to verse 13. Verse 13 says, when Gideon came, behold, a man was relating a dream to his friend. And he said, behold, I had a dream. A loaf of barley bread was tumbling into the camp of Midian. And it came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned it upside down so that the tent lay flat. So we know the first question that we ask about the dream, what is the main action? What's the big thing that's going on in this dream? Well, something is coming into the camp and striking the tents flat. That's the big thing. So we look, oh, in our waking world, what's that going to look like? That's actually literal. That's something coming into the camp and striking the tents flat. So the action matches up perfectly with waking life, with what God is talking about doing. But then, what is it that's coming into the camp? A loaf of barley bread. So that's where it gets weird. That's where it gets crazy and symbolic. It's a picture. And it's actually not weird at all. It's an awesome symbol when we look at it figuratively. Because remember, where did, where did God find Gideon? He was back there hiding out, threshing grain. So Gideon does not identify himself with like a sword. A Gideon identifies himself with grain. And God's like, hey, look what I can do with some grain, with some bread. You're going to wipe out the enemy. The other reason it was a loaf of bread is because a loaf of bread is small. Just like Gideon's army, right? We have a loaf of bread. We have a loaf of bread. Tiny. It's 300 men. So it's a small army. But look what God can do with a small army. The other thing about bread, it's weak. It's, it's soft, right? Because a brick, that's something small, but it's hard. You can still be violent with brick. But bread, that's not threatening. Well, how many know that both Midian and Gideon himself saw Gideon's army as a weak, non-threatening, small army? It was, it was not a threat at all. And the, the final reason that God used barley bread specifically, I heard a pastor teach that in that culture, in that time, that barley was actually the least esteemed among the green, uh, grains, like the least esteemed. Like if you had money, you wouldn't actually eat barley. You just ate it if you couldn't eat anything else. So it was very disregarded and dishonored and unesteemed, just like Gideon, just like his little tiny weak army, unesteemed, disregarded, not honored, not considered a threat. God said, I get how you see yourself, but I'm going to take that little, weak, soft, tiny, unesteemed loaf of bread, and look what I'm going to do. I'm going to wipe out the enemy army with it. So then, look what happens in verse 14. Verse 14 is pretty cool. His friend answered and said, 
is nothing less than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given Midian and all the camp into his hand. So he just hears this crazy dream, barley bread, doing what? And he didn't disregard it. They weren't confused by it. They immediately saw it as a symbol and a picture and a metaphor. And they said, look what God's going to do. This represents this. This means this. God is going to use Gideon to wipe us out. So we can learn a lot from a culture that understands the symbolism of their dreams and honors them. And actually, most other cultures in most other time periods of history have honored dreams way more than 21st century Western culture. So, so we can learn a lot from them. We want to get back to the biblical example, the biblical model of realizing that there are messages even in the crazy barley bread dreams and honor those messages. And then verse 15 is the best one. This is what we do with our dreams. Verse 15 says, it came about when Gideon heard the account of the dream and its interpretation that he bowed in worship. He returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the camp of Midian into your hands. So he didn't wake up and say, Oh, that was cool. Too bad it was just a dream. Yeah. Too bad it wasn't real. It was just a dream. No. He honored the dream. He saw God's revelation and God's message through it. And so he acted on the dream and he made the dream come true. So that's what we want to do too. So the last dream I'm going to share this evening is a fun one. And the reason I'm going to share it is because it shows you three more principles for dream interpretation and what they look in a real life dream. So the first principle we want to look for in this dream is the subjective and objective nature of dreams. That's what we can um, learn and understand. Um, most of our dreams are subjective, which means they're about ourselves. Like even though I dream of my husband or my father or my pastor or the president, it's not really about those people. They're just representing something else in my life, something that I'm thinking about, something that I'm praying for. They're just about me, my own heart issues. In the vast majority of our dreams, like 95% of the dreams that we have fall into this category. They're just about what's going on in our own hearts and lives. And they are the symbolic dreams, the metaphorical, allegorical dreams. Every once in a while, we have a more objective dream. And objective dreams tend to be a little bit more literal. Like the people in those dreams may actually represent those people in waking life. And the things that happen in the dream, they may actually happen like that in waking life. And a clue to realize that you are possibly having an objective dream is if you are an observer of the dream. If you are really not doing anything, if you're not interacting with anyone in the dream, if you're not participating in any way, if you're just kind of watching the movie play out on the screen in your mind, that's a clue that it may be a more objective dream. So that's number one. The second thing that we want to look at in this dream is about numbers, how numbers are literal in dreams. We want to say that everything in a dream is a symbol and it means something else except for numbers. If a number shows up in your dream, just say, okay, the number equals the number. The reason we do that is because every single time in the Bible that people had numbers in their dreams, the number equaled the number. Like Joseph dreamt of the 11 stars in the sky bowing down to him and the 11 sheaves of wheat bowing down to him. Well, that represented his 11 brothers. So the stars and the sheaves of wheat were symbolic. They were pictures that represented something else, his brothers. But the number was exactly the same. 11 equaled 11. Same thing with Pharaoh. Pharaoh dreams of seven ears of corn, and he dreams of 
seven fat cows, that represented seven years. So the corn was symbolic, the cows were symbolic, they represented years, but seven equals seven. So we just wanna make it really easy for ourselves, and we just wanna say, okay, the number equals the number. We we'll go with scriptural precedent. The third thing we want to look at in this dream is how important it is how you describe the dream. How you accurately use specific wording in describing what it is that you're seeing in the dream. For example, in the first dream that I shared, I was trying to get over something. Well, I was trying to pole vault, but that doesn't make any sense because I'm not actually pole vaulting in waking life. So I wanna, I wanna say, well, okay, what's another way to say that exact same thing? So I wanna change the wording, and I'm, I'm describing the same picture, but I'm gonna say, okay, I'm trying to get over something instead of pole vaulting. The same thing, different words. And that really, really help unlock, helps unlock the, the, the dream's message and the area of our life that the dream is speaking to. So if nothing is making any sense, play around with it. And a lot of times you'll get this revelation as you go to share the dream with someone or you go to write it down. And you'll, just, you'll use just a little bit different wording and a way to describe it. And you're like, oh, oh, that's what it means. That's what it's talking about. And the whole thing, it just shifts right into focus for you. So here is the dream. In the dream, I was with my mom and she was kind of freaking out. Um, my parents had just lost $182,000. While she is relating this to me, my dad calls my mom on the phone and says, oh my gosh, you will not believe this. I just went through $10,000 yesterday just on food just on food. I have no idea how I blew through 10 grand on food in one day. And he's just beside himself. He's incredulous. He can't believe it. And that's the dream. So the first thing we're going to look at is, am I doing anything in this dream? I'm not doing anything at all. I'm not interacting with anyone. I'm not even saying anything. I'm just listening to my mom talk to me. I'm watching her take a phone call. So I am observing, I'm not participating. So there's a clue right there that this dream may be objective. And whatever it's talking about might possibly be about someone other than myself. The next thing we wanna look at is all the numbers. So we had 182, that was a big number, 182K, right? $182,000, so we got 182, then we have 10, 10K. We're going to say we've got 10. And then we have one, because it was one day that he blew through this money. So we've got 182, 10, and one. So I had to look for those numbers in my waking life. Then we look at the emotion. What is the key emotion of this stream? Well, they were incredulous. That was the key emotion. They just couldn't believe it. So, where in my waking life is someone incredulous about something? Then we look at the setting. Well, the setting in waking life, I'm trying to match this stuff up. It, there wasn't anything to match up because, from the day before because this dream was actually prophetic. It was actually about something that was still to come. So the last thing we know that we need to understand is we gotta look at the action. What is the main action in this dream? Well, we could say that they just lost a ton of money. But we realize it's really important how we describe what we're seeing. So another way to say that exact same thing is that they actually gained a lot of debt. They gained a lot of debt. So possibly one way to look at this dream is to say, okay, this dream is about 
someone else's unwanted gain in a short period of time because of food. Someone else's unwanted gain in a short period of time because of food. If you see how that dream is kind of saying that, I want to say amen. Okay? So that's what the dream is saying. And so now I wake up from this dream. What in the world is this going to look like in waking life? My husband, it was a Saturday morning. I wake up from this dream. My husband had been up earlier before me. And he comes to me. He's like, oh my gosh, Charity, I just got on the scale this morning. I cannot believe my weight is all the way up to 182 pounds. I just gained 10 pounds in one week. So we see the dream was objective. It was about someone other than myself. We see that it was kind of symbolic um, in that, you know, the dollars represented pounds, right? And a week represented a day. And my dad represented my husband. And we might think that's kind of weird, but it's really not weird at all. My dad is a guy that I love, that I'm related to. My husband, Leo, is a guy that I love, that I'm related to. So for dream work, it's a perfect match. That's what it'll look like. And then we see the emotion matched up exactly. Dad was incredulous in the dream. Leo was incredulous in waking life. And the, num um, and the numbers were literal. The numbers equal the number. 182, 10, and 1. So that is how it works. That is how simple this is. We just look at the main action. We look at the main emotion. We look at our waking life, find out where we are experiencing these things. We match them up. Then we know what area of our life the dream is speaking to, and we can easily decode it then and understand God's message and his revelation to us through it. So in summary, you'll notice that we looked at a few different dreams from my life, from the Bible, but in every single one, you use the exact same principles of setting emotion action to decode the dream. So these interpretation skills are learnable. You're able to cultivate them, you're able to master them, and that's what we're gonna spend all day tomorrow looking at, equipping you even further with more of these keys, with more of these clues and principles for understanding the language that God speaks at night. So I wanna let you go so that you can get some sleep, so that you can have some dreams. But as dad mentioned, you have homework. When you go to bed at night, you have to put on your nightstand, you have to put a notepad, a journal, whatever, with a pen sitting right on top of it with the cap off. It's ready to write. And as soon as you wake up, immediately upon awakening, write down the dream. Because, just like dad said, by the end of the training tomorrow, you will be able to interpret that dream. You will be able to decode and decrypt and translate that language that God is speaking to you in the night. So if that sounds good to you, I want you guys to say amen. 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 Awesome. Well, I just want to pray for us all before we go tonight that we would have sweet sleep and dreams from heaven. So pray with me. Father God, we just come before you in Jesus' name, and we just thank you so much for your presence, Lord. We love you. You are so awesome. We thank you, God, that you are a communicating God, that you are so intimately uh, acquainted with all of areas of our life, and you want to be interactive. You want to participate, and you want to have conversations with, about it, with our, us about our lives. You want to share your insights and your revelation and your wisdom all day long and all night long too. 
So God, now we see how you speak through dreams. God, you were doing it in the Bible and you're still doing it now. So if we have not honored dreams in the past, God, we repent. We're sorry. We choose to see dreams the way you see dreams. God, we thank you that your word says that you do give to your beloved, even in our sleep. God, thank you that your word says you visit us in the night. God, thank you that your word says that you will speak to us in visions and that you will reveal yourself to us in dreams. So God, we go to bed expecting that. We're looking to meet you in our visions of the night. God, I just pray for your spirit's presence to be upon each one here as they go home and as they go to sleep tonight, that they would have dreams from heaven, that they would connect with your spirit. I thank you so much for the revelation, for the wisdom, for the blessing and the compassion and the instruction and the revelation you're going to pour out to each one of your beloved children, even tonight in their dreams. God, we thank you so much. You're such a good God. We bless you, Lord. And we thank you for all of these things. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen.